Corinthians chapter 3. We'll be standing here in Corinthians chapter 3. End of next month. There you go. Yep. Coordination. I went to Calvary. So I think back in the time there are lots. Just me and Heather, two other women most of the time for the first six months or so. Yet the Lord still blessed. Amen. Yes, yes. We go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. We're going to read verses 11 through 17. Here, Paul has been discussing the old and new covenants, the law versus the gospel, if you will. Pick up here, verse 11, and he says, For if that which is done away was glorious, much more that which remaineth is glorious. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech, and not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. But their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer before we begin. And the Father, we, we do thank you for this church here, Lord, and the truth that has stood on for 20 years now, Lord. I pray you continue to bless it. We might use it for many years to come, Lord. And no matter who or what may rise against us, we might remain faithful to thee. We certainly thank you for thy faithfulness towards us, Lord. Pray you meet with us now. Would you stir us up with your people? Would you bless us when we look into thy word? Pray you might even save souls among us today, Lord. Yes, Lord. We pray that you help us to be a light shining in the darkness around us and be busy about the work you've called us to do. We thank you for Christ and his sacrifice, Lord, not only that makes salvation possible, but that even secured it for thy people. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Now here Paul begins with, for that which was done away was glorious. Speaking of the old, co the old covenant, the law, if you will, it was glorious, Paul says, and yet he says even more so, that which remained is glorious. Amen. The old, Testament, the old covenant was a glorious thing, and, but yet the gospel is an even more glorious thing, isn't it? Amen. Yeah. He says, that which is done away with. The old covenant has been done away with. Hebrews 8, 13 tells us that. I'll turn and read that for us real quick. You know, there are some that say we're still under that covenant. There's some that say we still need to keep the law. Hmm. There's one fellow that told me new covenant means he renewed the old covenant. Hmm. But Hebrews 8, 13 says... You know, after he says he was established a new covenant, he says, In that he saith the new covenant, he hath made the first old, now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. In Christ we have a new covenant. That new covenant is found in verses 11 and 12, the same thing, really all the way back to verse 10. He says, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws in their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people, and they shall not. Teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, for the least to the greatest, for I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Amen. On the new covenant, he put the Spirit within us and gives us a new heart to serve him. Right. Yeah. We look, it was the last Sunday, I guess, at the old covenant song about how it demanded perfect obedience. Right. So oh, thanks be to God that Christ was our really the perfect obedience for us. He fulfilled the righteousness which the law required. Amen. John 1 14 says that when Christ came, we beheld the only begotten of the Father full of glory. Mm -hmm. We beheld the glory of Him full of grace and truth. Thanks, God. Amen. 
when Christ really was the fullness of the glory of God, bodily, if you will. And that's even more glorious thing than the old covenant. They could not take away sin. In verse 12, he says, Seeing then we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. In the gospel, we have a great hope, don't we? Amen. Amen. Hebrews 6, 19 describes it as a hope that is steadfast and sure. Amen. It was not a hope that, like the world thinks of. Mm -hmm. The world goes out and they buy a lottery ticket and they hope they win. There's a very little chance that they're going to. Right. The hope that we have in Christ is as sure as can be. Amen. The hope that he is coming again and, and he will receive us unto him that we'll be forever with him. That's the great hope of the believer. That's it. Amen. This is body of sin will be put away and the glorious body will be given to us. He says, seeing that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. Or you could say that to be great boldness of speech, or to be frank, he didn't sugarcoat or beat around the bush, if you will. Paul always got straight to the point. So he didn't say, well, I, I think Christ might be coming, so maybe you should get right. No. That's how many churches preach today, though, isn't it? That's it. Well, you can be sure Christ is coming in. As he says, in hours, you think not the Son of Man cometh. Right. We're told to be ready, for we don't know when he's coming. No, yeah. well, no matter what your thinking on eschatology might be, one thing is sure, no matter what, is he is coming again, and we are to be ready. Amen. That's it. He goes on in verse 13 and says, And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, the children of Israel could not steadfastly look at the end of that which is abolished. Let's refer back to Exodus chapter 34, verses 33 through 35, when Moses came down off the mountains. <coughs> he was so shining that the children of Israel couldn't look upon him. That's it. He Amen. put that veil over him. I don't know if you're familiar with the veil. You can't really see much through it, can you? You can't see much out of it. Right. You can see just a a shadow, if you will, a figure of what's there. That's really what the law was compared to Christ. You could see a figure of Christ in it. You could see the law pointed to Christ. You, the prophets pointed to Christ. They couldn't see him as plainly as we do. I have no doubt that the Old Testament saints knew the Messiah was coming, that they were believers. Right. Did they know that he would be a man named Jesus Christ and he would live 33 and a half years? He'd be born of Mary. I don't know if they knew all those details. Like right. He says, not as Moses would put a veil over his face, the children of Israel could not steadfastly look at the end of that which is abolished. Again, he's referring to the law of the old covenant that was abolished. Ephesians 2.15 tells us very plainly that that was abolished in Christ. In verse 14 of Peter 2, he says, For he is our peace who hath who hath both made or has made both one and hath broken down the middle of all partition between us and having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, or to make in himself a plain one new man, so making peace. Amen. Oh, in Christ, that law of commandments was abolished. No, that doesn't mean we're free to live however we want to. I'll get to that in a moment. But that's exactly right. But that law which could not take away sin was abolished in Christ. That law which required perfect obedience, that was taken away in Christ. That was abolished, done away with, if you will. Well, he, well, it says Christ is in the law for righteousness in Romans 10, 4. In Luke 16, 16 says, For the law and prophets were until John, and John prepared the way for Christ. Amen. Yeah. All right. As we looked at, certainly the law did not save anyone, but the law was had to be kept. Amen. The law could not give life. That was a problem with the law. It was weak, Paul says in Romans, <laughs> that it could not give life. 
yet it will still require that we, man would keep it to the best of his ability. And when the law is broken, it required sacrifice, it required offerings. Sometimes it required death of the trespassers. But with Christ was the end of all that was in the human and his perfect fulfillment of it. Yet in the law and all those things that are required, it all pointed to Christ. It all our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, Paul says. Amen. Verse 14, he says, But their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil and taken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day, when Moses read the veil is upon their heart. You know, not every Jew was saved, but not every Jew was of spiritual Israel. Was. That's right. Romans 9, 6 says they were not all of Israel that are Israel. There was a whole lot of unsaved folks in the in the nation of Israel. Right. And you see very plainly that there was a core in his crew where earth swallowed them up whole. That's it. Amen. But as we looked last week, it required faith, just as Abraham had. And no different today for us that faith is required. It was no different in Christ's time that faith was required. We said their minds were blinded. And the Jews are blinded even to this day. Let's turn for a moment to Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. Three verses five through eight, and skip down towards the end of the chapter. He says, "Even so, then at this time, also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. It's always been of grace. Too bad. For if by grace, then it is no more works; otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace; otherwise, work is no more work. Too bad. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. It's good." According as it is written, God has given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that should not see, and ears that they should not hear unto this day. <laughs> see, it was still of grace, even in Israel's day. Amen. We said there, we say there, their eyes were blinded, the election hath obtained, hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. But for the, those that are not saved today, their eyes are blinded to the things of God. Their hearts are blinded, if you will. Amen. So if you go down to, towards the end of the chapter here, verse 25, the Romans 11, it says, For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so shall all Israel be saved, as is written, there cometh, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. And this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. You know, we as Gentiles shouldn't boast that we have the gospel now. That's right. Yeah. He says it very plainly in there. He can cut us off just as easily as he cut the Jews off. That's it. No blindness in part has come to them until, as he calls it, the fullness of the Gentiles will be coming. One day, God will turn back Israel. Many of them will believe. I don't know when that day is exactly, but I know it's coming. We get Blindness is really upon all those that are not born again. Mm -hmm. We'll turn over to John chapter 12. We'll see this. John chapter 12, Christ is quoting Isaiah here. Verse number 39 and 40. Or, excuse me, John was quoting from Isaiah here. <clears throat> After Christ had spoken to him, they didn't understand. He says, therefore they could not believe because that Isaiah said again, he that hath blinded, or he hath blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. The lost cannot believe in and of themselves because they're blinded and their hearts are hardened. Amen. That's the problem with decisional regeneration and Amen. Works right. based salvation and really even especially the far extremes of Arminianism. But it's up to man to make a decision, up to man to turn to God. Mm. The man is blind, man is hard. Man. man has a veil upon his heart, as it says here in our text. 
And man cannot remove that veil of himself, can he? That's it. Really, man has no desire to. You're right. And they're just content walking around in that darkness. He said they're he said that veil is in a way in Christ. And Christ can remove the veil, can he? Christ Amen. can open the eyes. Yeah. In fact, I think in one place I didn't write this verse down, but it says that Christ came to open the eyes of the blind. Yeah. Yeah. Not just physically speaking, but spiritually. Amen. Well. That's it. But even to this day, he says, which includes our day to day, that the veil is upon the hearts of Israelites when Moses is read. Amen. One day that veil will be removed, as we saw. You know, for God's elect, one day he'll remove the veil and they'll believe. But it's not our job to pick out the elect, is it? It's our job to simply preach the gospel. Going on to verse number 16, he says, Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now, I've heard two theories on what he's speaking of here. It referring to Israel when they turn to God. Or it speaking of the heart, going back to the end of the verse 15 there, when it shall turn to God, the veil shall be taken away. Mm -hmm. When the heart's turned to God, the veil is taken away. Mm -hmm. Acts 16, 14 tells us about Lydia, whose heart the Lord opened. Amen. I think of back in John chapter 4, I preached a message out of that at Almstead about six years ago. Showing how the Samaritan woman, the story, story of the Samaritan woman, how it relates to salvation. Mm -hmm. well, she didn't see Christ for who he was, did she? No. Nope. She said, well, first she saw him as a man. Well, sir, how you draw water? You know, I can draw it. And she went on to say, well, I perceive thou art a prophet. Later, around verse 25, she said, well, I know Messiah is called Christ has to come. It wasn't until verse 26 when Christ said, I speak to thee and he. That's not. That's when she knew who he was. That's it. Yeah. Christ has to reveal himself unto him. So you can be a good person. You can try to go to church. You can do all these things you want to, but until Christ reveals himself unto you, you won't see him for who he truly is. Amen. You know, I think of Mary after the resurrection. He said she thought he was a gardener, didn't she? Yet when he spoke to her, he she knew who he was. It's really no different spiritually either, though. Man, natural man doesn't know who God is until he reveals himself to him. That's it. Until he takes that veil away that they can see. Now verse 17 is what I really want to look at today. Now if the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. First, notice the Lord is that Spirit. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, which we're probably going to use, is just as much deity as the Father and the Son. He is just as much Lord as Christ is. You now, some of the data teaches he's not deity, but he's just the breath of God, the Word of God. That's where the Hebrew roots movement starts, and then they go on to deny the deity of Christ. All right. But no, the Holy Spirit is just as much God as the other two. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Well, there's a lot of talk about liberty today, isn't there? A lot of talk about slavery. Well, I, see. I thought it was interesting that this word liberty in the Greek comes from the opposite of the word slavery. I mean, free. I mean, liberty is synonymous with freedom. Loosely defined, it would be to do as one pleases. However, Christian liberty, as we often call it, is not a license to sin. Galatians Amen. 5.13 tells us this very plainly. It says, For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty, only you not liberty for an occasion of the flesh, but by love serve one another. Amen. We have freedom in Christ, don't we? Yet yeah, we're not to use that, he says, for an occasion to the flesh, to, to make, to do what the flesh would want to do, but we're rather we're to use it to, to love one another. Amen. To serve one another. 
no liberty as far as the Bible is concerned is really to do the freedom to do as we ought to rather than as we please to. Amen. Even liberty in this country is really to do as we ought to rather than as we please to. Right. So there are still certain laws that have to be abided by. I can't get mad about Larry go over and shoot him. Right. That's not liberty. Amen. <laughs> well, that's anarchy. There's the, not the same thing. Amen. No Christian liberty is often misapplied today, though, isn't it? Say, well, we can live however we want to live. That's not what Paul meant by liberty. He says, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. You know, we're often, we've been called the land of liberty here in America. Amen. We certainly have enjoyed much civil and religious liberties, but yet they seem to be slipping away, don't they? Yep, that's it. He says, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. I think that's been the key throughout our history, that the Spirit of the Lord has been, you say, welcome here. The Christians have been able to freely, <laughs> freely worship God without persecution for many right. years. Though that time seems to be drawn ever to a close. And that's it. You can be sure religious liberty will go and soon after civil liberties will be gone too. You know, I was reading Brother Pink on this and he had said, I can't remember exactly how he worded it, but he had said that seeing that we have such great liberties in this country, the least we can do is pray for our president and Congress that that's it. these liberties will continue. Like that. Yeah. I'd like to look at kind of what liberty does for us, if you will. As opposed to the law, which was a yoke of bondage, we have liberty in Christ. We have freedom, if you will. Amen. Galatians, again, Galatians talks a lot about the law and grace. Galatians 5, 1 tells us, Stand fast, therefore, in liberty, wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Amen. To stand fast, what we looked a few weeks ago, was to be fastened, if you will, to be firm, to be established. Mm -hmm. We stand fast in the liberty, wherewith Christ has made us free. And he says, be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. In the Galatians, we are trying to go back to keeping the law. We're not to go back that way. Amen. The law is good, Paul says. The law, as far as we know, the law of Moses has been done away with. Amen. Oh, uh, we're still to obey God. We're still to keep his commandments. But the law was a yoke that we could not bear. That's it. He called the yoke of bondage here over in Acts 15, 10. Peter says, I think it was Peter, or maybe it was Paul, said that when you put a yoke upon their necks that neither ye nor your fathers could bear. That's it. And there was a debate about the Gentile believers need to keep the whole law, be circumcised, and all those things. And they came to the conclusion that no, they didn't need to. They said we need to keep from fornication, from, from things strangled, from, thing, from blood, from idols. Yet we have many aisles today, yet fornication runs rampant today, doesn't it? That's it. But we have liberty to serve God, but yet we're not free to just live however we want to. Yeah. I think Christian liberty could be summed up in one verse over in John chapter 8, verse 32. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Amen. Really, in our whole Christian liberty is found in the Word of God. The teachings of man cannot make free. The teachings of all the books in the world, all the self-help books in the world cannot make you free. But yet, the Word of God can give you that liberty. Amen. And the five ways that Christian liberty delivers us, if you will. First, it delivers us from the wrath of God. John chapter 3, let's turn there. John chapter 3, verse 36. You know, we're all familiar with the earlier part of this chapter where Christ talks about being born again to Nicodemus. John 3, 16, the 
famous verse about how God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Right. But we don't think about the opposite of that for those who don't believe. Verse 36 says, For he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God lieth on him. Amen. And for all those that aren't believing, the wrath of God is upon them already, he says. And one day it'll be fully poured out in the lake of fire. You can be sure if you die in your sins, the wrath of God will be upon them. You're right, amen. Ephesians 2 verse 3 says that we were as the children of wrath mm -hmm. before we were saved. Let me turn over to Ephesians chapter 5. And very plainly he says that the wrath of God is upon sinners. Ephesians 5 verse 3 and 6 just reminded me of a, the sermon by John Edwards of Sinners in the hand of an angry God. Mm -hmm. That's what he says in chapter or verse three of chapter five. It says, "But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as a covetous thing, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of things. For this ye know that no whoremonger nor unclean person nor covetous man who is an idolater hath an inheritance in the kingdom of God, Amen. the kingdom of Christ and of God." Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. That's it. The wrath of God waits all those who are in their sins. Yet Christ delivers, doesn't he? First Thessalonians 1 10 tells us that Christ delivered us from the wrath of God, from the wrath that comes, he says. In Christ we've been delivered from this wrath that Amen. waits. The second thing that he gives us deliverance from is the power of Satan. Let's turn back to chapter 2 of Ephesians. I'm sure we've all heard this verse. Verse 2 says, Where in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirits now work within the children of disobedience. He said, We walk according to the prince of the power of the air. That's Satan. That's it. The prince of the power of the air. And before the Lord saved us, we walked according to his ways. That's it. John chapter 8, verse 44, Christ tells the Jews there, Ye are of your father the devil, and the deeds of your father you will do. You know, there's some that would say all the lost are the children of the devil. Some say only the non elect lost are the children of the devil. I'm not sure which is accurate, but. It's, you can be sure all the unsaved are doing the bidding of Satan today. That's it. Amen. They're certainly not doing the bidding of God. In 2 Timothy 2.6, we won't turn there, but Paul tells Timothy that Satan takes men captive at his will. So Satan is a powerful being spiritually, isn't he? And he has a lot of power over the unbelievers. Yet Christ delivers from that. Let's turn to Acts chapter 26. Six and verse 15 through 18. Here Paul is recounting his salvation again, his testimony, if you will. He says, And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But rise and stand up upon thy feet. For I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen and of the, those things which excuse me, and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee. That was verse 18. To open their eyes and to turn them from the darkness to light. Amen. And from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Through the gospel delivered from the power of Satan unto God, he says. Amen. Now certainly we're going to still fight with Satan in his ends, but he has no power over us. That's it. Resist the devil and he will flee from you, is what our command is. Be no match for the person of Christ. Amen. 
Next thing that Liberty delivers is from, this one might sound a little odd, but the authority of man. Now I'm not saying that tomorrow Adam can walk in the barbershop and say, Tim, I'm not doing things the way you want to, I'm gonna do it my way now. <laughs> no, we were speaking in spiritual matters here. Right. Man is not, does not have authority over us in the person of Christ. Amen. That's the problem with Roman Catholicism, the Jehovah's Witnesses as they call themselves. Well, you're a slave to those institutions. You have to give an account to the the priest and the bishops and the pope. That's it. When Russellitism, you have to give an account to the Watchtower Society. Right. Well, I don't know if they still do it, but in that book that I'm reading about in the early days, you had to literally give an account to them of mm -hmm. how you spent your time, mm -hmm. how many books you sold. You Knowing Christ, we have liberty. We are we belong to the Lord, not to man. Amen. Let's turn for a moment to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Brother, uh, <laughs> Brother Junior touched on this a little bit in his lesson. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 through 20. Say what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? Amen. For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God your body and your spirit, which are God's. Amen. We belong to God, don't we? That's it. Turn over to the next chapter, chapter 7, verse 22 and 23. He says, For he that is called the Lord, being a servant, is the Lord's free man. Likewise, also he that is called being free is Christ's servant. Ye are bought with a price, being, be not ye the servants of men. Amen. And we serve God, not man. Well, yeah. He says, Here we are the Lord's free man. We're no longer slaves to sin, no longer slaves to Satan, we're no longer slaves to do the bidding of other men, but rather we are do the bidding of Christ now. Amen. Like I said, we still have to obey the, the government as long as they don't contradict the word of God. But really, it's just Christian liberty that frees us from the government, if you will, when they go against the word of God. Amen. To the unsaved, they're bound to obey the government, no matter what the government may say. They have nowhere to stand upon to defy the government, but yet we can be as apostles and say we ought to obey God rather than man. Amen. We may come to that in our country, I don't know. Yep. But if it doesn't, we ought to obey God rather than man. Amen. Amen. Yeah. You know, the powers that be are ordained of God, Romans 13 tells us, but yet only as far as they are a protector of good. They outstep their authority when they become persecutors of that which is good, when they become perpetrators of that which is evil. Yeah. That's really the basis on which Christians founded this country, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I know not all of them were good godly men that found this country. Some claim that many of them were Masons, I don't know. But yet, as far the principles of the Word of God, the liberty which is in, only can be found in Christ, which Amen. many of the principles of this country are founded on. The next I'd like us to look at the probably the more obvious one, deliverance from sin and its bondage. Let's turn over to John chapter 8. You know, in Christ we have deliverance from sin. In Christ we have been delivered even from the bondage of sin. <coughs> John chapter 8, verse 32. Here's where he says, And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Amen. Now he's speaking to some Jews here. It says in verse 33, They answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? You know, I'm not quite sure how they were never in bondage. You know, they forgot the oh. Israelites in Egypt. Right. But nevertheless, they were never they were still free to serve God as best they could in Egypt. He says verse 34, Jesus answered them, Verily, verily I say unto you, whosoever committed sin is the servant of sin. Amen. 
And some say that the word servant could also be translated slave. You know, if we commit sin, we're the servant of sin. We're really the slave of sin. We're in bondage to sin. That's it. And so has every man since Adam been born in bondage to sin. He goes on to say, And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. If the son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. When Christ sets us free, we're truly free, aren't we? Amen. Man can not set free like God can. A man might can set his slaves free, but yet they're still in bondage to sin. That's it. Verse 37, he says, I know ye are Abraham's seed, but ye seek to kill me because my word hath no place in you. I speak that which I have seen in my father, and ye do that which ye have seen with your father. Speaking of their father, the devil. Right. He says that that's down there in verse 44. So outside of Christ, we are servants of sin, but inside of Christ, we are free from sin. Amen. You know, the law, as I mentioned earlier, it didn't leave very much room for liberty, for freedom. Mm -hmm. In fact, the only provision for liberty in the law was once every 50 years. The year of Jubilee, you were set servants free, you were returned things that you belonged to other people. Right. Other than that, it required perfect obedience and there was no liberty in it. Oh, but when the Son shall set you free, you shall be free indeed. Yeah. When Christ sets us free, we're no longer in bondage to sin. We're no longer under its rule and authority. We're no longer under the authority of man or Satan. The wrath of God no longer abides upon us. Amen. Sets us completely and truly free. It says, let's turn over to Romans chapter 6. Verse 16. It says, Know ye not that whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey his servants ye are, and to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness? That's a uh, we're servants of one thing or another, either righteousness or sin, he says. But thank or but God we think that you were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that which that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. If we were the servants of sin, but God has set us free. So then we made free from sin. You may say, well, I still struggle with sin. Oh, in the spiritual man, you've been set free from sin. Amen. The flesh will contend with sin until it is either in the grave or it's changed into its glorious form. Amen. And one day we'll realize full deliverance from sin when this corruptible puts on incorruption, this mortal puts on immortality. Amen. You can make sure you're in the spirit here, free from sin. He goes on down verse 20. He says, For when you were the servant of sin, you were free from righteousness. And when we were servants of sin, we weren't worried about righteousness. No, nope. we couldn't do any righteousness in and of ourselves. But verse 22, he says, But now we being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have freedom to holiness and in everlasting life. Now we're the servants of God. Now we're servants of righteousness. See, this is doing as we ought to, not as we please. Right. We are to serve God first and foremost. He says the end of there is everlasting life. Amen. If we really possess it now, we'll realize it fully when Christ comes again. Amen. As we see here, we've been delivered from sin, but we've been delivered to serve God. It's our last point. Turn over to First Peter for a minute. First Peter chapter two. Verses fifteen and sixteen. It says, For so is the will of God that you that with well doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. As free, not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. 
to our liberty is not to be used as the, as the cloak of Galatians, but rather to serve God. Amen. You know, when a criminal is pardoned, you don't expect them to go out and commit the same crime again to you. That's all right. It's really been no different with us. We've been pardoned from sin. We've been set free from sin. We're not to go right back into that sin again. Amen. In other words, we use this liberty to serve God, to serve one another, as we saw in Galatians 5. And this might seem like a contradiction to the, the flesh or the carnal mind, but really God's law is a free and law, isn't it? Amen. James chapter 1. Turn and read that for just one. James chapter 1, verse 25. He says, But whoso looketh in the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful here, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Now, this law of liberty is not speaking of the law of Moses, it's really speaking of the commands we have in Christ. Mm. which are first and foremost to love the neighbor as thyself and to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. Amen. You know, he says, on these hang all the law and prophets. In 1 John 1, <laughs> excuse me, 1 John 5, 3, he says, that to love God is to keep his commandments, and the commandments are not grievous, they're not burdensome. Amen. No, we keep... The law of liberty, as he calls it here, is to be blessed. A well, man likes to think he's free, he can go out and do whatever he wants to do. You know, this flesh wants to do it, wants to sin. You're right. Amen. As long as you sin, you'll be servant to sin. Sin might start looking out good, but it never ends good. That's it. It's enjoyable for a season, Hebrews 11 says, but it's not enjoyable forever. It always brings about turmoil, difficulties, sometimes diseases and sicknesses come along with it. It's sad. But oh, to serve the law of God, to serve God and keep his commandments, that's true liberty. Amen. Let's turn for a moment to Luke chapter 1. We'll close here in just a second. Luke chapter 1, verses 74 and 75. Here, uh, Zacchaeus had been silent for a little while, but he was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied in verse 67. Verse 74, he says that he, speaking of God, would grant unto us that we, being delivered out of the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear and holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. Amen. He's, Certainly he delivered Israel out of their hand of their enemies, that they might serve him. He delivered us out of the hand of our enemies, that we might serve him as well. He says here, all the days of our life. Amen. There's no getting off point for the child of God, is there? There's no retirement in the Christian life. No, we are to serve him. He says here, without fear and holiness and righteousness, all the days of our life. Amen. Well, that's the least we can do with liberty which he's granted us. That he has set us free from sin, its punishments, its wrath. How he's delivered us from Satan, his power. Oh, how we ought to simply serve God with that liberty. Amen. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free, he says. You want to be free even more from sins? We need to study his word, don't we? That's it. Say, like I said, I said you may struggle with sin still. But that's the beauty of the new covenants. We, First John one nine tells us if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. Amen. You know, we don't have to go out and find the perfect lamb and slay it and sacrifice it before God. Now it's done in Christ. Amen. We ought simply just to serve Him with His liberty which He's given us. And when we fail, we go to him and ask for forgiveness. Oh, but for the unsaved, they know nothing of this liberty. Their hearts are blinded, if you will. They have 
that veil just as the children of Israel did upon their hearts. Well, we have to pray that God will remove that veil from them and reveal himself unto them. Amen. You can't know true liberty without sight of the person of Christ. Yeah. Man strives and tries to be a better person a lot of times. You know what the Bible says? He ends up being seven more times, sevenfold more child of hell. Right. A man into himself cannot bring about liberty. Man cannot free himself from sin. The sin that is one that you will ever be working to pay off and never be able to pay off. Amen. For what Christ paid that debt for us. As we sang earlier, Jesus paid it all. Amen. On him is true liberty. When the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And he brings that to us through the person of the Holy Spirit today. But when we kick out the Holy Spirit, we don't expect liberty to stay. Right. When, as a nation, we reject God and his ways. We can't expect liberty to stick around either. You're right. Everywhere God's word is, has been, is upheld, if you will, has been the standard, liberty has prevailed. But everywhere it's not, bondage has been there, hasn't it? It's it. So I'm not going to get off on politics, but Marxism, as they call it, is anti-God, isn't it? That's it. There's no liberty in that. Amen. Let's go ahead and close with that thought. Amen.